number theory, lecture 17. So what I did on Monday was prove some results about the Euler phi function. Phi of m. And we proved several important things about the phi function. First, a nice formula for it, that this is the product over all the distinct primes that divide m, one minus one over p times m. Second, that the order phi function is multiplicative. That means that phi of m times n, phi of a product, is phi of m times phi of n if the greatest common divisor of m and n is one. And the third, which is a very uh, uh, interesting result, it is uh, the following fact that for all positive integers m, if we take the sum over all the divisors of m, phi of d, that's equal to m. So this is really a fascinating result. Um, let me just work out one uh, more example of it. Suppose I take uh, m equal to, um, I don't know, 28. So what are the divisors of 28? They are one, two, four, seven, 14, and 28. So if we sum over all the divisors of 28, phi of d, that's equal to phi of one plus phi of two plus phi of four plus phi of seven plus phi of 14 plus phi of 28. <clears throat> what are these numbers? Phi of one is one, phi of two is one, phi of four is two, seven is a prime, so phi of seven is six. What is phi of 14? Let me just calculate that there. The primes dividing 14 are two and seven, so this is one minus a half, one minus a seventh times 14. This is one half times six over seven times 14. That's six. What's phi of 28? Again, the primes dividing 28 are also two and seven. So this is one minus a half, one minus a seventh, times 28, that's one half times six sevenths over 28. Two times seven is 14, 14 into 28 goes two, and six times two is 12. So this is plus 12. And if we add this together, what do we get? One plus one is two, plus two is four, plus six is 10, plus six is 16, plus 12, is 28. So if you sum phi of d over the divisors of 28, you end up with 28, just what, she, just what we should get. Okay, so we proved this on Monday. And then we began to discuss on Monday, and I'll start, I'll review it right now, the Chinese remainder theorem. And in its simplest form, in its first form, it says the following, called the CRT. Doesn't mean cathode ray tube, it means Chinese remainder theorem. So in the text, this is theorem 2.9, says the following, let M and N be 
positive integers. For any integers, a and b, there exists an integer x <laughs> such that you can simultaneously satisfy two congruences. X is congruent to A mod M, and X is also congruent to B mod N. So this is like solving two equations. Well, it's actually two, two congruences, but with one variable. You can find such an X if and only if A is congruent to B, modulo the greatest common divisor of M and N. And if this condition is satisfied, then Y is also a solution. If and only if x is congruent to y modulo the least common multiple of m and n. This means the least common multiple. And again, just to make, uh, so let's look at an example. Suppose I want to solve the congruences x congruent to 5 mod 12. And <clears throat> x congruent to 8 mod, um, or let's make it different, x congruent to um, 11 mod 21. So in this example, A is 5, B is 11, M is 12, N is 21. What's the greatest common divisor of M and N in this case? That's the greatest common divisor of 12 and 21. The largest integer dividing both of these is 3. And A, which is 5, is congruent to 11 mod 3 because this difference is minus 6 and 3 divides 6. So this congruence will have a solution and sometimes you're lucky and you can just guess a solution but I can't at the moment. So let's say if there is a solution and we know there is the number x has to be if it's 5 mod 12 it's 5 plus some multiple of 12. Say 5 plus 12 u for some u. With any number congruent to 5 mod 12 of this form. And then this number has to be congruent to 11 mod 21, which means 12 u has to be congruent to 6 mod 21. Um, I can actually divide everything by 3, because 3 divides this side, this side, and this. So 4u congruent to 2 mod 7. Uh -huh. What's the solution of this congruence? Um, 4. Right? u congruent to 4 mod 7. Because 4 times 4 is 16. 16 minus 2 is 14 is divisible by 7. So u can be any number congruent to 4 mod 7. So u is 4 plus 7 times some number v. And so x, which is 5 plus 12u, is 5 plus 12 times 
4 plus 7v, 12 times 4 is 48, plus 5, 53, plus 12 times 7, 12 times 7 is 84. X is 53 plus 84v. Is this actually correct? If you've tried x equal to 53, 53 minus 5 is 48, is 4 times 12. 53 minus 11 is 42, is 2 times 21. So 53 is a solution. If you take the numbers 12 and 21, what is the least common multiple? The smallest integer divisible by both 12 and 21 is in fact 84. So the set of solutions of these, these congruences are any x congruent to 53 mod 84. So this is the first form of the Chinese remainder theorem in action. That's what we proved. Monday. Now, there's another form of the Chinese remainder theorem, which is very useful. When you have more than two congruences, and we'll look at these congruences in the simplest case when the moduli are pairwise relatively prime. So this is theorem 2.10. So it says, let k be at least two. We're going to be looking at k congruences. Let a1, a2 up to ak be any integers. And let m1, f2 up to m sub k be positive integers that are pairwise relatively prime. That means if you take any pair of these numbers, mi and mj, the greatest common divisor is one for all i different from j. So then there exists an integer x such that all the following k congruences are satisfied. X at the same time, x is congruent to a1 mod m1, x is congruent to a2 mod m2, x is congruent to a sub k mod m sub k. And then the set of all solutions is the set of all y congruent to this particular solution x modulo the product of these moduli. So before I prove the theorem, let me give an example. Suppose I let k equal four, and I consider the following set of four congruences. I want to solve x congruent to two mod three, x congruent to three mod five, x congruent to five mod seven, and x congruent to 7 mod 11. So the right-hand sides of these congruences in this setup, a1 is 2, a2 is 3, 
A3 is 5, and A4 is 7. And the moduli are M1 equals 3, M2 equals 5, M3 equals 7, M4 equals 11. And these moduli are pairwise relatively prime. The greatest common divisor of any two of them is one. For I and J between one and four. So according to the theorem, this system of congruences will have a solution and we just have to figure out what it is. Let's see. Well, we can do it step by step. It takes a certain amount of work, but we can do it. If x is congruent to 2 mod 3, x is equal to 2 plus 3u, and that number has to be congruent to 3 mod 5, which means 3u is congruent to 1 mod 5, and this has a unique solution u congruent to 2 mod 5. So u is 2 plus 5 times v. And so x is 2 plus 3u is 2 plus 3 times 2 plus 5v. x is 8. 2 plus 6 is 8 plus 15v. So this number, 8 plus 15v, satisfies these first two congruences, but then it also has to satisfy the third. This has to be congruent to five mod seven, which is the same as saying 15V is congruent to five minus eight minus three mod seven. Minus three is the same as four, and mod seven, 15V is V. So V is going to be a number of the form 4 plus 7w. And so x, which was 8 plus 15v, is 8 plus 15, 4 plus 7w. 4 times 15 is 60. This is 68 plus 7 times 15, 105w. And you can check that 68 satisfies all of the first three congruences. And now we have to deal with the fourth. The fourth is the congruence x congruent to 7, mod 11. We just saw that x is a number 68 plus 105 w. So this has to be congruent to 7 mod 11. So 105w is congruent to 7 minus 68, or minus 61 mod 11. This is all mod 11. And minus 61 is congruent to 5. So 61 plus 5 is 66 is divisible by 11. And if you divide 11 into 105, you get a remainder. It's 99 plus 6, 6 W. So we have to satisfy the congruence, 6 W congruent to 5 mod 11. And then it's clear, one solution is if W is minus 1, minus 6 minus 5 is minus 11. So W congruent to minus 1 mod 11. So x, which is 68 plus 105w, is 68 plus 105 minus 1 mod 11. That means w is minus 1 plus 11t. So I can put in minus 1 plus 11t. 68 minus 105 is minus 37. Plus 105 times 11 is 1155. 
or x congruence minus 37, the set of all solutions are all x congruent to minus 37, modulo 11, 55. Or if you like positive numbers, minus 37 is the same as 11, 18. So in either of these forms, this is the answer. Let's check. So minus 37, let's see, um, x is supposed to be congruent to 2 mod 3. Minus 37 mod 3, this is minus 1 or 2 mod 3. So that checks. Minus 37 mod 5 is minus 2 or 3 mod 5. So that checks. Minus 37 mod 7, this is also minus 2 mod 7 which is five mod seven. So that checks. And mod 11 minus 37 is minus four, which is seven mod 11. So all of these congruences are satisfied with minus 37 or 1,118 or any number congruent to minus three mod 1155. And 1155, is the product of the four moduli. This is three times five times seven times 11. That's where the 1155 comes from. Hmm. So how do we prove the second form of the Chinese remainder theorem? Again, this is it. You have K congruences, pairwise relatively prime moduli, M1, M2 up to MK, and you fix any K integers, A1 up to AK. So I want to prove there's a unique solution to this system of congruences, modulo the greatest common divisor, I'm <clears throat> sorry, the least common multiple or the product of the moduli. So the proof of this theorem so the proof will be by induction on the number of, of congruences k. So for k equal two, this simply says that x congruent to a1 mod m1, x congruent to a2 mod m2, and greatest common divisor of m1 and m2 equal one. This has a solution and the solution is all x congruent to, um, sorry, if you have one solution, uh, so there is a solution, and the solution, if you have a solution X, every other solution is all Y congruent to X, modulo the least common multiple of these two relatively prime moduli, which is M1, M2. So this is the, this was, this is the Chinese remainder theorem for two congruences, which we just proved. So, Assume the statement is true for k minus one congruences, k at least three, and we have now, and so we consider k congruences, x1 congruent to a1 mod m1, 
down to xk minus 1 congruent to ak minus 1 mod m sub k minus 1 xk congruent to a sub k mod m sub k. So by the induction hypothesis, there exists a solution x such that x solves the first k minus 1 congruences. And in fact, x congruent to a1 mod m1 down to x xk minus 1 congruent to ak minus 1 mod m1. This solution is equivalent to being able to solve the congruence y congruent to some particular x. Uh, sorry, this is not x1. This is some x. Let me call this. Um, there's some x that satisfies all these congruences. And the x that satisfy these congruence are all congruent, any number congruent to that x modulo the product of the mk of the product of these first k minus one congruences. So we can solve this system of congruences if and only if we can solve the two congruences. Let me call this uh, y congruent to x mod this, and also find a y congruent to a k mod m sub k. But these moduli are relatively prime m1, m2, up to m sub k minus 1. Greatest common divisor with mk is 1. So here we have two congruences. The moduli are relatively prime. This number is relatively prime to mk. By the first form of the Chinese remainder theorem, this pair of two congruences has a solution and the solution is unique modulo the least common multiple of the moduli, but these are relatively prime, so their least common multiple is the product, and we're done. So there is in this proof, as is now becoming pretty common, a lot of number theory to think about, and the, the TLs are all written down carefully and legibly in the book, and I suggest, I recommend that you study the book a lot about this. Okay. There's a lot more one can say about the Chinese remainder theorem but I want to move on to what is the last major theorem uh, that we're going to prove about congruences and the Euler phi function. And that's the following. So there was a theorem proved by Fermat that says the following, that P we have prime number and A any number relatively prime to P, then A to the power P minus one is always congruent to one mod P. And this may look strange or harmless or whatever, but it really is quite fascinating. Let's take an example. Suppose I take um, P equal three and A any number prime to P, say A equal to five. So a to the p minus one is five to the three minus one is five squared, 
is 25, and 25 is congruent to 1, modulo p equal 3, because 25 minus 1 is 24, is 3 times a is divisible by 3. Let us take p equals 7, I don't know, a equal to 10. No, a equal 10 is the same as a equal 3. a equal to 5. So this says that 5 to the 6th is congruent to 1 mod 7. Now, I don't know, is that true? What is 5 to the 6th? 5 to the 6, 5 times 5 is 25, times 5 is 125, times 5 is 625. Five to the sixth power is fifteen thousand six hundred and twenty-five. So five to the six minus one is fifteen thousand six twenty-four. Is this divisible by seven? I don't know. Seven into fifteen six twenty-four. Two. Two, three, two. Yeah, this is equal to seven times 2,232. So five to the sixth is congruent to one mod seven. Right? I mean, I mean, it's very interesting. Let's take another example. I don't know. Suppose I take P equal 13 and A equal to 4. Okay. So according to Fermat's theorem, P is 13 is a prime. 13 minus 1 is 12. According to Fermat's theorem, 4 to the 12th has to be congruent to 1 mod 13. Is that true? Let's see. 4 to the 12th, which is the same as 2 to the 24th. That's a big number. Um, two to the 24th is 16 million seven hundred and seventy seven thousand. 216, that's four to the 12th. Subtract one, I get 16,777,215. That's supposed to be divisible by 13. What is that? Um, Well, what is that? Turns out, I'm just using my calculator. This is exactly 13 times one million two hundred and ninety thousand five hundred and fifty five. So four to the twelfth is congruent to one mod thirteen. So that's Fermat's theorem. And Fermat lived in the 17th century. And in the 18th century, Fermat was French. Swiss mathematician named Euler generalized this. And he generalized it in 
the following way. So Fermat's theorem says A to the P minus one is congruent to one mod P. And if A and P are relatively prime. And notice that P is prime. So phi of P is P minus one. This is also says A to the phi of P, A to the phi of P is congruent to one mod P if P is prime. And Euler extended this to any modulus, not necessarily prime. So replace P by any positive integer M. And Euler's theorem says that A to the phi of M is congruent to one mod M if A and M are relatively prime. So let's look at an example of this where um, M is composite. So suppose, so let's look at an example, I'll say M equals 10. So phi of M is what? The primes dividing 10 are two and five. So this is one half times four fifths times 10, that's equal to four. Suppose I take A equal to, see what's a number relatively prime to 10? Seven. So according to Euler's theorem, seven to the fourth power should be congruent to one mod 10. Is this true? What is seven to the fourth? Let's see, seven times seven is 49, 49 times seven is 343, and 343 times seven or seven to the fourth power is 2,401 equals. And 2,007 to the fourth minus one is 2,401 minus one is 2,400 is congruent to zero mod 10, because 10 certainly divides that. So seven to the fourth is congruent to one mod 10. So let's try to prove Euler's theorem. So let me write it down again. So in the text, this is theorem. 212, and it says um, that m be a positive integer and let a be an integer relatively prime to m, that is the greatest common divisor of a and m is one, then a raised to the power of phi of m is congruent to one mod m. A to the phi of m minus one is always exactly divisible by m with no remainder. That's Euler's theorem. So one proof goes as follows. So what is phi of m? Phi of m, the order phi function, is the number of integers from zero up to m that are relatively prime to m. And the phi of m, so that 
R1, R2, R3 up to R sub phi of M, B A reduced system of residues modulo M. And just to remind you, that means that um, if X is relatively prime to M, then X is congruent to Ri mod M for some unique element in this system, right? That's what a reduced system of residues is. Now, If A and M are relatively prime and R and M are relatively prime, then A, R, and M are relatively prime. Because if, if the product A, R was not relatively prime to M, there would be a prime P that divides M and divides A, R. And then P would uh, divide either A or R or both and then the greatest common divisor of AM and RM would not both be one. So the product is relatively prime to M. So that means that if I take the elements in this reduced system of residues and I multiply each of them, every one of these numbers is relatively prime to M. And moreover, no two of these are congruent. If I is different from J, and then a r i is not congruent to r j, not congruent to a r j mod m, because if these two were congruent, then if m divides a r i minus r j, which is ARI a minus ARJ, which is A times R minus RJ. If M were to divide, if two such numbers were congruent mod M, the difference would be divisible by M. So M divides A times RI minus RJ, but M and A are relatively prime. That was the hypothesis. So M would divide RI minus RJ by Euclid's lemma and RI would be congruent to RJ mod M, which is not true. So this set of numbers, this is phi of M numbers, each of which is relatively prime to M and no two of them are congruent to each other. So this is another reduced system of residues. modulo M. So if I have the numbers AR1, AR2, up to AR phi of M, each of these is congruent to some unique one of the RIs. So this is congruent to R1, R2, up to R phi of M mod M. But in this product, I have phi of M factors so I have a phi of m times a to the power of phi of m times the product of the r's congruent to the product of the r's mod m. So m divides this minus this. Let me just write that down. So I have A to the phi of M times R1, R2 up to R sub phi of M is congruent to R1, R2 up to R sub phi of M mod M. So that means the difference is divisible by M. And what is the difference? A to the phi of M times R1, R2 up to R sub phi of M minus R1, R2 up to R sub phi of M. I can factor this out. I get A to the phi of M minus one times 
R1, R2, up to R sub B of M mod M. Sorry, this mod, the difference is congruent to zero mod M. This minus this is zero mod M, but so this is zero mod M. So M divides A to the phi of M minus one times R1, R2 up to R sub phi of M. But M and this product are relatively prime. So by Euclid's lemma, M divides this. which means A to the phi of M is congruent to one mod M. That's what we had to prove. So we can go a little bit further with this. So again, this is Euler's theorem. It says that if A and M are relatively prime, then A to the phi of M is congruent to one mod M. Let's look at another example. Suppose I take the modulus to be 15 and A to be equal to seven. So phi of 15, which is phi of three times five, we already saw is equal to eight. So by Euclid's theorem, seven to the power eight is congruent to one mod 15. For fun, let's calculate the least non-negative residue of powers of 7 mod 15. So 7 to the first power is congruent to 7 mod 15. 7 squared is 49, which is 45 plus 4. This is congruent to 4 mod 15. 7 cubed, that's 7 times 7 squared, that's congruent to 7 times 4, which is 28, which is congruent to 13, mod 15. 7 to the 4th is 7 squared squared, is congruent to 4 squared, is congruent to 16, is congruent to one mod 15. So we know from Euler that seven to the eighth power, that seven to the power eight is congruent to one mod 15, but also seven to the fourth is congruent to one mod 15. And we define the order of an element as follows, so that A and M be relatively prime integers, M is positive. 
what is called the order of A modulo M is the smallest positive integer K such that A to the K is congruent to one mod M. So we know phi of M works, so we know that K is less than or equal to phi of M. But it doesn't have to be equal to phi of M. So in this example, seven mod 15, seven to the eighth power is one, but seven to the fourth power is also one. And this is actually, and, and four is the smallest exponent, such that seven to the exponent four, seven to the power four is congruent to one mod 15. So the order of seven mod 15 is not eight, is four. Now, let's calculate the orders uh, of all the elements uh, with respect to some modulus. It's an interesting exercise. Let's take, um, I don't know, suppose I take m equal to five. And I want to look at numbers a where a and five are relatively prime. So the numbers relatively prime to five are the congruence classes, one, two, three, and four. Let's see. So for each such a, find the order of a modulo five. So if a is equal to one, What's the smallest power of one congruent to one mod five? It's one to the first power. So if I make a little table here, um, A and the order of A mod five, when A is one, the order is one. What about two? What's the smallest power of two congruent to one mod five? Uh, two squared is four, two cubed is eight, two to the fourth is 16, it's four. So the order of two mod five is four. What about three? So three, what power of three is congruent to one mod five? Three, 9, 27, 81. 3 to the 4th is 81 is congruent to 1 mod 5. For so for 3, the order is 5. What about 4? Four? 4 squared is 16 is congruent to 1 mod 5. So the order of 4 is 2. So for the congruence classes, relatively prime, to five, these are the orders. Let's take another example. Suppose I take um, m equal to eight. Phi of eight is equal to four. And what are the congruence classes relatively prime to eight? The odd numbers, one, three, five, and seven. And what is the order of a? modulo eight. Well, one, one to the first power is congruent to one mod eight. So the order of one is one. What's the smallest power of three congruent to one mod eight? Actually, it's three squared. Three squared is nine, which is congruent to one mod eight. So three has order two. Five squared, five is not congruent to one mod eight, but five squared is 25, is congruent to one mod eight because 
25 minus 1 is 24, is 3 times 8. And of course, 7 squared is 49. 49 minus 1 is 48, so 7 is order 2. So these are the least exponents. I mean, we know that for any one of these numbers, a to the phi of 8, which is a to the fourth, is congruent to 1 mod 8, if a is 1, 3, 5, or 7. But in fact, the smallest exponents are either one or two in this case. So there is an important theorem that says that if a and m are relatively prime, we know that a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 mod, uh, mod m. But a smaller power might be. That smaller power is called the order. And the theorem says that if d is the order of a, modulo m, then d always divides phi of m, which is what we saw in these examples. Each of these numbers divides 4, each of these numbers divides 4. And there is an extension of this. Um, maybe I'll prove this first and then I'll prove the extension. So that K be the order of A modulo M. We must prove K divides phi of M. Now, if K is the order of A modulo M, that means K is the smallest integer, so A to the K is congruent to 1 mod M. And we know by Euler that A to the phi of M is congruent to 1 mod M. So let's divide V of M by K. So V of M is K times Q plus the remainder. The remainder is between zero and K minus one. So A to the V of M is the same. This is all mod M is A to the KQ plus R mod M. A to the phi of m is congruent to 1. This is A to the kq. This is just rules for exponents. A to the r. A to the kq is A to the k to the q times A to the r. But A to the k is congruent to 1 mod m. So this is 1 to the q times A to the r. 1 to any power is 1. This is just a to the r mod m. So this says that if the remainder, when you divide phi of m by k, is r, a to the r is congruent to 1 mod m. But r is strictly smaller than k. And k is the smallest positive exponent that satisfies this congruence. 
So R can't be positive. Um, R strictly less than K implies R equals zero. If R equals zero, phi of M is K times Q, or K divides phi of M. That's the proof. Hmm. Let's uh, let me look at that's so we did a lot today so far. Let me just do a few exercises just to have some more numerical examples. So what's the least non-negative residue of three mod 1024? 1024 is two to the tenth. And three and 1024 are relatively prime. So three to the phi of ten twenty four is congruent to one mod ten twenty four. But if ten twenty four is two to the tenth, phi of ten twenty four is one minus a half times ten twenty four is a half of ten twenty four is five hundred and twelve. So three to the power of 512 is congruent to one mod 1024. Here's another problem. Find the remainder when 751 is divided by 144. So when you take seven to the power of 51 and divide by 144, what is the remainder? Now, uh, a rather tedious way to do this would to raise seven to the 51st power and divide it by 144. But seven to the 51st power is bigger than 10 to the 43. It's some huge number. So you don't want to do this by long division. So your only hope is to do something else. And let's see, what is the remainder? 707 to the power of 51 congruent to what number R mod 144? Well, we've been using Euler's theorem. So presumably we solved this problem by using Euler's theorem. What is phi of 144? So 144 is 12 squared, or 2 to the 4th, 3 squared, I think, right? 9 times uh, 16. So phi of 144 is the primes dividing 144 are 2 and 3. So 1 minus a half, 1 minus a third times 144. That's a half times two thirds times 144. That's 144 over three. That's equal to 48. So seven to the power of 48 is congruent to one mod 144. This is by Euler. If I multiply this by seven, 
I guess 7, 4 to the 49 is congruent to 7. Mod 144. If I multiply this by 7 again, 7 to the 50 is congruent to 7 squared, or 49, mod 144. 7 to the 51 is 7 times 7 to the 50. It's congruent to 7 times 49. 7 times 49, or 343. What's 343 mod 144? If you divide 144 into 343, this goes twice, 288, and this leaves a remainder. 3 taken away 8 is 5. 3 taken away 5. So this is 343, 288. So that's 55. So this is congruent to 55 mod 144, and that's the answer. Okay. Uh, well, you'll get a better understanding of what's going on by doing a lot of exercises, and uh, I'll assign some for Monday. Um, yeah. So we've pretty, we haven't quite finished. There's more to do in chapter two, section five, but uh, I think that's probably enough for today. Are there any questions before we stop? Okay. See you uh, on Monday.